<laughs> okay, so this is the second, there's seven churches. Last week was Ephesus. This, the second church is Smyrna. I, I noticed that Pastor Wayne has difficulty pronouncing it, right? So, and it, it's covered in chapter two, verse eight to 11. And the scripture said, and, the, and to the angel of the church of Smyrna writes the word of the first and the last who died and came to life. And this is what that person said. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for 10 days, you will have tribulation. That's the way make reference to the 10 days. Uh, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And then last week we talked about he who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the church. It's in all seven of the letters. And then the one who conquers that part is also in all seven churches. This part, the, the promise part, is different. And we said last time, he will have let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. Uh, we point out that he said to the church. And then after he finished, he said what the Spirit said to the churches. So that means this each one of this letter is not just meant for that one specific church, but it's a broader application, right? And then, even though this is the word of Jesus, they say what the Spirit says. And then it remind us what Jesus said in Gospel of John, that after he leaves, the Holy Spirit is going to teach us everything about Jesus, right? That want to teach us. So it's a continuation. So, it, And then now the Holy Spirit is continuing to teach us. So the idea that these seven letters is not just for that church back in those days, is also for us. So let's take a look. Mouse. Okay, Smyrna is interesting, right? We last week we saw Ephesus, and we know that it, it's kind of follows some sort of trade route, but it's and then some uh scholar also says it's a circle, so it meant to be the letters supposed to be go around. So we don't know that, it's just guess. But specific for Smyrna, the interesting thing is the Smyrna is literally means myrrh, right? Yeah. When the wise man, the magi came to see Jesus, they brought him three uh, gifts. gifts. And what are those three gifts? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And myrrh, right? Myrrh is used in burial and bombing. So even, you know, when everyone comes, we'll remember that they came uh, when Jesus too, right? When they came, the idea is that Jesus eventually is going to die, right? And so it has to do with embalming. So we will see later, this is a church that's going to be persecuted. So it's kind of interesting that, that this, well, it's a harbor city is also a very prosperous portrait, just like Ephesus, uh, but it's much smaller. And it has many temples as a temple of Zeus. And there is a significant uh, Jewish population there. Uh, in historical said that, and also in chapter, I mean, verse nine, it says so. And the Jews are strongly anti Christian, anti Christian. And then, because of this worship of Roman emperor, there was edicts after what the Roman emperor wanted people to worship them. And so, Christian refused to do that. And then, so that led to they are not, they are, they would be persecuted by the Roman officials, but they also have the anti. Christian Jews, so they have double wham, right? So they, okay. Uh, this is uh, not too long ago, maybe four or five years ago. Uh, Smyrna, by the way, it's this of these seven churches, only two of them is in continued existence. It's not just a bunch of relics. And but people, because it's an ancient city, people have been digging around uh, in the Agora, which is a marketplace. Uh, of Smyrna, there was a church there, and then they 
uh, take around and saw these uh, graffitis on the wall. See, graffiti goes way back. <laughs> not just, and, and these archaeologists thought that they may be, these are crosswoods. But one of them, this one in the middle, this spells logos. So some, some of the people think that that may be just the Christians, they were being persecuted. So they want to identify themselves as Christian. They have to have some sort of symbols or words. So I, we don't know. So it's just like the fish, right? You know why do we have the fish? The Greek word for fish is ichthus, right? So those five letters stand for Jesus Christ, Son of God. So, so that may be, so I don't know, maybe they add to the understanding that that's a church that's being persecuted. Some, you know, circumstantial evidence. Would it stand up in court? I don't know, right? But each of the, well, last time we say that chapter one, John has a vision of Jesus Christ. And then this description of Jesus Christ, each part of it, some small part of it, is come to introduce the speaker of this letter. So it's not all seven, it's not the same. So what that means is that the speaker wants to introduce himself in such a way that who he is related to the content of the letter, right? So, uh, so that's how it works. So, like, you know, someday Steve's gonna write a letter to Matthew and he, he would say, Matthew, this is your dad who gave you life. And so what he went to say, he wanted him to listen to him, right? So tied to the content. Right? So, I use that with, when I write all my kids. <laughs> and what, why, what do you say, I gave you life? Oh. Then I can take it away. So. Oh, I see. <laughs> there you go. See that? So you listen to me or else. See that? So Jesus said, he said, I'm the first and the last who died and came to life. Now, he didn't use this for other church. For this church, that's what, what he used. So what does that mean? Uh, how can we warm that down? Can you just use your um, page channel? Use the keyboard. Yeah, the keyboard. Just uh -huh. using the wrong There you go. Okay. <laughs> oh, that might seem easier. Okay. The first and the last is actually also used in chapter 117, a description of Jesus Christ, as I said. But it's also used at the end. Jesus Christ talked about himself. And at the end, it's actually it's longer. Not just first and the last, but first and last is also alpha and omega, the first letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet and the beginning and the end. And, and if you look at that, Alpha Omega is in, in Revelation is used of God. So Jesus is claiming himself to be God. And the beginning and end, that means he encompassed the whole thing. He's in control of history. And as we will see that these people can be, that history is in the hand of God, right? Remember we sing this, the song, I know who holds tomorrow. Right, so that you have confidence that whatever is, he's in control. So you keep this in mind when you see the rest of the letter that Jesus is in control. And then Jesus said, I I'm the one who died and come to life. And that's also what uh, the description of Jesus, Jesus said to John when he first saw him, he says, I'm the living one, I die and behold, I come alive forevermore. And I hope the keys of death and Hades. So Jesus, when he said, I'm, I die and come to life, came to life means that he's resurrected. But not only if you go back to chapter one, not just that he's resurrected, but he, once he's resurrected, he controls death and Hades, death and hell. And hell. So he overcomes death and hell. Okay. So, so just thinking about this part of it, Makes, makes sense, right? 
So resurrection means that resurrection gives assurance for people who are persecuted. If you go to first uh, Corinthians chapter 15, that's where Paul talks about re resurrection, the whole thing. But I need my glasses if I'm going to read this. Maybe it's somebody else can read this. The print is too small, not your eyes. Oh, the print is too small. <laughs> Well, if I go like this, I can see it. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter, he said, other, he's going through rest, uh, resurrection, right? Then he said, otherwise, why do people, why do, oh, no, no. he said, but in fact, Christ has been risen from the dead, the first fruit of those who have been fallen asleep. That Jesus Christ's resurrection is uh, like a guarantee that we will be resurrected, right? For as by one man death came, and by one man came also come also the resurrection from the dead, right? So the whole idea is, is Jesus is saying to them, I'm in control of history, and I will bring people back to life from resurrection, right? So 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 even before we look at the letter to Smyrna, we already get a hint that he is talking about something, right? Just something about this church. So if you keep that in mind, um, what this, so if you, for, for every letter that you look at, you should ask the question, what, how is the introduction of himself sets the tone for the letter, right? Uh, sets the tone of the letter. Recently I've been, uh, uh, reading a couple of books about China. One is about the Taiping Revolution, uh, Taiping, whatever, insurrection. And it doesn't do anything to you guys because you guys don't care about Chinese history. Okay. And then the other one has to do with the Opium War. That's how China ended up uh, opened up. There was a description of uh, the first attempt to send an embassy to Beijing and the, the, the King of England would have a letter and he kind of set himself as lower than the King of China. So, you know, so that sets the tone, right? How you introduce yourself sets the tone, right? And just like you say, I'm your father, so it sets the tone for them to listen. <laughs> Another word, this is to answer your question. Last time you say, who is the angel, right? It's why I said to the angel of the church, right? So why not just to the church? It's every church. So who are the, who is this angel of the church? I know I'm going through this preliminary stuff, but I think it's important. So this will take care of all the other weeks that we don't, may not have to address this question again. And the word angel, right? Angelos, it just literally means messenger. And there are four different ways uh, most look at it could refer to like guardian angel, right? The letter is to the guardian angel of the church, or is it? It's just spiritualized church, and or else to the leader of the church, or literally just to the guy who's carrying the letter. Well, so any of you go to look at all these biblical scholars and commentaries, not, they don't agree on one or the other. And a couple of them say, well, it's a combination of one and two and something like that. So there is no consensus of what that means, right? But if we go back to chapter one, so you, everything keeps referring back to chapter one. It says, you know, you see Jesus Christ walking among the seven lampstands. The seven lampstands are the church. And then there were seven stars. The stars are the angels of the church. So the angel seems to be separate from the church. I don't know, right? Is there, is there something other than the church generically to the whole, um, to the congregation, so to speak? So, is it, so, so I tend to think that it's to the leader of the church, but that's just me. Because I mean, if I have to pick one, I should pick one, right? So, so because the angels 
It's just like uh, chapter one, verse 20. The angels are not the church itself. He separated the lampstand from the stars. So, so what does that mean? I, my guess is probably that it is probably just, perhaps it's addressed to the leaders of the church. And then the leader is to take that and you know, represent the church. So, you know, when you think about the, some, you, you can't, well, I guess today it's easy, right? You have an open letter, you send an email broadcast it. But back in those days, you, you send it to the leader and the leader is shared. So first, let's look at the commendation, right? Jesus, remember we, last week we talked about, I know it's from personal experience. That we, there are two, at least two different Greek words for now to knowing, right? This is from not head knowledge and personal experience. But we know that because from chapter one, we have a picture of Jesus walking among the seven lampstands. So he's literally impressed, is present with the church, right? So, and Jesus said that, well, whenever two of you, two or three of you are gathered in my name, I'll be. So Jesus is gonna be with us, right? So, so what, when Jesus said, I know your tribulation, he knows that it's it's a personal knowledge. It's not just, oh yeah, I read, I saw it on TV kind of thing, right? So Jesus said, I know your tribulation, your poverty, and the slander of those who say they are Jews or are not. And we'll come back and look at the rest of the other one. So essentially, Jesus said, I know that means I know you're suffering. Jesus commend them for suffering. Right, so I mean, we're doing too good, then Jesus may not have come in and say, right? So, if you lose your job, you get sick, Jesus said, Good job. That sounds like that, right? Sounds a little weird, but, but but let's see what that means, right? So, there's three things tribulation, poverty, and slander. The question is that Jesus is commanding, is he commanding them that they just having those, if you're doing bad, you lose your job, Jesus say, all right. Is that what that means? Oh, you're poor, all right, you lost all your money, great. It's like the opposite of the prosperity gospel. Right? Well, okay, so, so you think this thing said, Jesus said, if, if, the, if anybody in the church who if the church makes too much money, that's bad. Is that what he's saying? Well, let's see what he says, right? what he means, right? So, but when you, you know, without taking people just look superficial, that sounds like Jesus is happy that the church suffered. So, I don't want to be sacrilegious. Sounds like Jesus is a sadist. But it really is it. So let's look at it, right? So good thing there's a lot of metal here so that the lightning doesn't strike me. Can't get through. <laughs> well, that's what I said. I mean, get struck by lightning. So, okay. Uh, the word tribulation is just a basic word that describes problems, right? So essentially, they have two problems. And the, the two aspects of the problem is this they are poor. And the, when they're poor, by the way, this word poverty is very u- unique word. They have a lot of words of poverty, but this word is only used here in Second Corinthians, talk about Macedonian churches and other churches, too. and then about Jesus Christ, right? In Second Corinthians, right? Jesus is poor, poor, became poor so that you can be rich to the Second Corinthians. So it talks about economic deprivation specifically right and so and then he said but you are rich what kind of riches they possess and most commentators think that it's about the spiritual wealth as compared to material wealth and then by the way when we come to the Laodicean church it's just the opposite they think they are rich but Jesus said that you're poor so economic uh, deprivation that they are poor is an aspect of their tribulation. Well, you think about it. Uh, 
your neighbors are against you, the Jews are against you, the Roman, the, the government's against you. It's kind of hard to make a living, right? It's kind of hard to make a living. So that's why they're poor. But Jesus said, said to them, but you're rich. It's an obvious, it's not about material wealth. They have a richness in their spiritual life. I think that's what that means. And I think if you think about it, uh, persecuted church generally spiritually, you know, uh, the house church in China, you know, did a lot of spiritual growth came through them, their spiritual richness. So, but, but anyway, the other thing is that they said, you guys suffer from the slander, the words blasphemy. And in Revelation, other than here, it's always used about against God, right? Against the name of God. So slander means that they're standing in the communities being defamed, all right? They're wrongly accused for doing things, doing things that are not right, right? So who are the slanderers? Who are the slanderers? Let's take a look. And he said, you are slandered by those who say they are Jews, uh, but they are not really Jews. And they are the so-called Jews. Uh, it actually is a synagogue of Satan. Right? The, word, the phrase synagogue of Satan also used in the letter to the Philadelphia church in Philadelphia. So there's a lot of interplay here. And when we come to the whoever teach the church in Philadelphia, and can we go back to this? So there are two things. The, the persecutors who pro, provide slanders are the Jews and the synagogue are Satan. So what are these two, two things talked about? As you say Jews, that means Smyrna actually, as we say, has a very large Jewish population. And Jews are the primary opponent to the Christians. Remember this, the first century church, if you go back and look at Book of Acts, chapter 13, 14, 17, 18, 21, I mean, all the persecutors of the church, the Christians are the Jews. Uh, so, and then Jesus said, they are not really Jews, right? So what that means is who are the true, true Jews in Roman tells us that two, the true Jews are the one who believe in Jesus Christ, right? Romans 2 says, those who are born physically Jewish, the descendant of Abraham, they're not really they are The true Jews are the one who believe. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 7, 9, it said that also. So you, you, you can look at that for yourself. So in other words, in Jesus' view, the people who persecute Christians because they themselves don't believe in Jesus. They are not really Jews. Right? Jews are the children of promise of Abraham. And so that, this thing brings that back. And this, this phrase synagogue of Satan, when he says that synagogue is where the Jewish people gather together. Once they're outside to the, the promised land, they can't go to the temple. So when they meet together, they meet the place called synagogue. And so the Jews are gathering together, they're gathering together when they persecute Christians, they are really doing Satan's work. And we know that this, this, the slander verse or the people who accuse Christians is Satan, right? In chapter 12, verse 10, so in Zechariah, the, the one who accused, or come before God to accuse the high priest, right? Uh, is Satan. All right, book of Job, you know, he goes up to heaven, Satan goes up to heaven, say, oh yeah, you know, you, Job doesn't really care for you. He just, you just do good things. So he's, a, so we have evidence of that. But in Romans 8, 33, 34, was that read today? No. Was that the call of worship today? Close, close, okay. And, and he's talking about who can condemn us, right? This, right? But Jesus is Christ is the one who will justify. So, so we get an idea that Jesus <laughs> said to the, the church that you've been going through these trouble, right? These are your persecutors. 
and I commend you for going through tribulation. So that's, I just can't just leave you hanging, but we won't know that until we come, come after, after the, the next section, right? So Jesus just praise him. I know you do this, that you, you just endure suffering. Great, that's it, right? If you left it at that, it's kind of weird, right? So what does that mean? Well, he didn't leave us just with that, but he goes on to explain. But then after uh, commendation, you should come with condemnation. Right? There is no condemnation in this letter. In Smyrna, and then there's another letter. Jesus to the church of Philadelphia, there's no condemnation. See, churches in Philadelphia are the greatest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jesus will not condemn a church in Philadelphia. So let's just pat ourselves on the back. We have nothing. Jesus find nothing wrong with churches in Philadelphia, except it's not this Philadelphia. It's too bad. <laughs> So, well, um, I, I was just looking up Smyrna. I saw there's at least three towns, at least three towns in the U.S. named after Smyrna. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like Delaware, Tennessee, Indeed. Georgia, at least. Right. Yeah. So if you were in Smyrna, you don't want to go to church there. <laughs> because you'll be persecuted, you'll be slandered, and you'll be poor. <laughs> so, so no. but seriously, uh, there's a lot of people talk about why this is right. Usually a church they're in persecution, they have no time to get into trouble, right? No time to get into trouble. It's only when you're doing well, then you, you start forgetting God and they start going. Up. So there are a lot of kind of explanation. Here's one that's pretty good. Uh, Grand Oxford, I, I mentioned him last time. He said, it is telling that these two churches were also the least significant of seven churches in terms of number of influence. So he went back historically, look at those two cities and the church there doesn't seem to be big. And then it, he said, the current preoccupation of modern church with numbers and influence must be re-examined. It's more important to be faithful than to be powerful. I think that has, I think it has a lot of uh, implication for us today, especially in the age of the mega church. And, right? So Jesus actually did correct them. But if they didn't do anything wrong, why should he correct them? Well, I think it's more of a warning than a mission. And a mission didn't say you did something wrong. He says, do not fear what you are about to suffer and be faithful unto death. I will give you the crown of life, right? So, so I, I, the warning, I think, is more preventative, right? Preventative, preventative, right? So when you suffer, 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 sooner or later, you're going to throw in the towel. Right? I mean, I came to the United States, 1968. Uh, Philadelphia Eagles was really bad. You, how many of you were around in 1968? Okay, you remember what the chants of the Eagles fans were? <laughs> I was only seven. <laughs> this coach Joe must go. The, the coach of Joe Kuhari. It was so bad that we wanted to get rid of our coach. Of course, it happened before. So, I, so I've been a long suffering Eagles fan. <laughs> and when I went to Dallas, when I went to Dallas, I was in enemy territory. I mean, I get bombarded all the time. I could easily throw in the tower and become a cowboy fan, but I never did. <laughs> <laughs> and now we be, you know, <laughs> uh, so, so the question really is, no, when you get beat up so much, there's a danger that you throw in the towel and just forget it, I'll just join the enemy. And so when Jesus said, don't fear, 
right? Don't fear, be faithful. Literal means the stop being afraid. It, that means when you're going through suffering, they're going through tribulation. It's not that they, they don't have emotions. They do have emotions. They are afraid. Jesus says, stop being afraid. And then he said, be faithful unto that. Be faithful means put the trust in God, right? So how do you encourage people going through um, tribulations? Well, that's what Jesus said. You stick with it. You tell them to stick with it. And you know, if you ever go through people that are in trouble and difficulty, financial, you can, or physical difficulty, and say, brother, please trust God. Stick with it. Sometimes they'll say to you, yeah, easy for you to say, right? <laughs> but that's what, but, but that's what Jesus said. We, the, the church of Smyrna would say to Jesus, yeah, it's easy for you to say. But no, but the whole idea is that they need to be encouraged and, and uh, you know, supported so that they can continue to go through, right? But you, it's not that, the thing is that you have to be so conscious that you are in the right path that you're willing to die. They're willing to die for it. You have to be so certain to trust God that you have to be so certain that's the right course. Right? Sometimes I read, you know, my friends that put things on Facebook or Twitter that go through chemotherapy. That is how, how hard it is, you know, every episode is something good. But they must go all the way through, right? Well, so when, in some ways it's telling us that if a church is in trial, then you need to go all the way through, come out the other end. And even if you're gonna die, you should be willing to. And this happened in Daniel chapter three. And I'm not gonna steal your thunder, but Daniel's three friends. Uh, I only know their Babylonian name. <laughs> Misha, no, I don't. Azariah. I only know their veggie tops. Right, right. So my shack, your shack, and a bungalow. That's what they call the street. But they said, the, the, the king says, and your friend will throw in the fire. They said, you know, we trust our God who will deliver us, even if he doesn't. Right. So you have to be prepared. And obviously they will say that again, right? So and first Corinthians 10 13 tells us that for most of us, whenever God put us through trial or test, he always provide a way out. So nine out of 10 times for most of us, whatever testing that God put us through, the trial is not gonna lead to death. There's always a way out. And that gives us some confidence that, but then we have to also should be like Daniel's friends that if God doesn't, God actually wanted to take our lives, it's okay with us, that we trust. So, this is not so much a correction, but Jesus Christ admonishing them that, you know, don't give up. And a little bit, and a little bit later, when we look at this through historically, that becomes an important question. So then Jesus, Jesus said, you know, he who has the here, right? And then at the end, he gives this challenge, right? Well, last time we said, the challenge is not the one who conquers. What do they conquer? is reflected through what the promise is, right? It's a view, the challenge is to conquer. How do you conquer, right? We, we said the last time, uh, without going through the, the detail that the, 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 to overcome or to conquer uh, is to timeless and, gene and generic uh, with the Greek structures there. And so what do we conquer, what do we <laughs> overcome is the, reflected through the reward. And so that you, we should be willing to uh, lose our physical life because the second death cannot hurt them. This is talked about that in chapter 20 at the end. Up in, when, 
when Jesus Christ came back, right? That those people who, even though they, those people, the second death is an eternal death cannot hurt them. They cannot, they cannot hurt them. So if you think about that, if you can lose this life, but you can, this, you will never suffer the eternal judgment, isn't that worth it, right? So that's what that means. And then what is the challenge? And the challenge, and going back to the same thing we've been talking about at this point, is to stay true to the resurrected Christ. Right? Jesus said at the beginning, I died and came back to life. So if you die, you will come back to life along with me. So the challenge to the church that going through suffering is to stay true to the Christ who is resurrected, who was and is, right? He's the first and the last and dying and come to life. So last time we talked about that there are three ways to look at these letters. First is exactly what happened to that church in Smyrna. So we went through the detail of understanding that what those words mean to them, the first century church. But we also know that, that it, each of these churches reflect a part of the church history. Ephesus represent the apostolic age, right? That so easily, for, even though they're so close to Christ and apostles, that they easily lose their first love, right? So the passion, the initial passion just went away. And initially, they in Acts 2, they love each other, they throw everything, everything in one part and after while the mutual love fall off. Now, the, right after that, after the first century, from the first century to 300, the, uh, 323, 313, 323, those years, there was 10 major persecutions. So a lot of people interpret the 10 days as maybe have reflections back to Daniel, but they also have reflection forward that there were 10 periods of severe persecution of the church under the 10 different Roman emperors. And I'll, I'll go through these with you. Obviously, everybody know Nero, he's right, he was fiddling while the Roman was burning, Rome, city of Rome was burning. And then he said that the Christian caused it, right? So, so that's beginning uh, the persecution of Christians. And he's the one under his reign, and he's the one who crucified Peter. Peter was crucified in Rome. Paul was beheaded in Rome, so that was. And then after him, there was gap between some emperors in, later, in the later stages. But Domitian is one of a very cruel person, and he murdered his own brother. So I mean, so he's not. And during his reign, John, Apostle John was one that who was was uh, banished to Patmos, and that's where he wrote the Book of Revelation. So there was a series of Christian being persecuted. The third a Roman emperor that persecuted Christian was uh, in the large scale was Trajan. And he murdered thousands and thousands of Christians. And we have historical record. Uh, Pliny the Younger, there were two Roman historians way back then. Pliny the, the father, Pliny the older, and the Pliny the Younger, the Pliny the Younger wrote about his eyewitness to thousands of Christians being killed. And then under Marcus Aurelius, uh, there was a, a bunch of persecution, but one noted fact was Polycarp, who was a bishop of Smyrna, was burned at stake. And uh, most of these came from the book of uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. There are other people would put 10 different ones, but you know, uh, most people follow Fox's. Uh, he written in the 16th century, so he, whether he has as good a record as we have these days, we don't know. And then Severus in 192 AD, under his reign, the, uh, the persecution went. So that's five. And the next five was Maximus. Um, in, uh, you know, the seven churches we see is in the, in the Roman province of Asia, which is today's Turkey, and then to, to the east of it, it's, it's also it's still in Turkey. It's the um, province of Cappadocia, and that that there was a 
extermination of Christians in the last, I mean, just killed them. Right, so uh, this is 249, uh, you know, common people's, because Roman edicts say you have to worship emperor. So if you don't worship emperor, you are a criminal. So people killing people rather than officially going through that. So people in their zeal to show that they, they, they were the good loyal citizens. They killed the people who don't follow Roman law. So. Uh, Valerian, uh, then Aurelian and Diocletian. Diocletian is uh, one of the worst persecution under Diocletian. And uh, they not only just tried to destroy Christians, they tried to dis destroy Christian books. So they burned Christian books and then so on and so forth. You know, the idea of Christianity has been, of course, right after the Diocletian, after he, his reign came the reign of Constantine. And under Constantine, Constantine became a Christian and then he allowed Christianity to flourish and Christianity become more or less some sort of state religion. And of course that becomes the next area and the Christian, it, Christianity become compromised with the Roman society and ultimately it's not, it's not good. So we'll see. Uh, so then, what does it mean to us today? I want to go through a couple of these and then we'll discuss, right? Uh, Osborne said, this is especially for those who are going through tough times, right? This letter is helpful uh, for people who are going through a tough time. And he said, you look at it, there are persecution can apply to us but we, even though we don't have, we, even though we're not under over uh, persecution, at least not in America anyway, right? So what that means is that we can identify with many Christians who are suffering around the world, right? So we can be sensitive to other, you, you want to know where people are suffering, you know, multiple the boys, there are databases show what countries where Christians are being persecuted. Second, we can re also realize that persecution can happen here and we should be ready for it. Persecution can happen anywhere. The third thing is that we should be thinking about ourselves, how many compromises we have made in order to avoid any persecution at work in secular society. That seems to be uh, particularly uh, directed at us individually. And then, and then third, fourthly is, is to endure, that we should endure a general trial that draws us away from the world and draws Christ. So if we're going through less than persecution that severe, but when we're going through trial, we should endure it so that it will pull us away from the world and draw us closer to Christ. So he thinks that there are four different ways that we can think about how we can apply this. Of course, when you talk about application, you have to look at this book, right? There's a set of commentary. They use NIV, NIV application commentary. But definition is supposed to have to apply. It's really pretty good, actually. Uh, most people who ask me, I'm doing a Bible study with a group, what should I use? I say, well, just take NIV application commentary. They went through the text so very well, and then they helped you bridge, and then they helped you so, and this is from the application section. It said, the Craig Clean Kina, no relationship to my uh, in laws. I thought in laws are Kina, but it's not related to Craig Kina is a good, very good commentator. And he says, Right, have you read it much? Okay, if we have not prepared ourselves in our congregation to die for Christ's name if necessary. We have not complete our responsibility for preparing disciples. I haven't heard our pastor telling us to be prepared to die. <laughs> you haven't done your job. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sunday, Sunday. So I don't read the gospel. Maybe because it's the gospel of Mark. We went to the gospel of Mark. We didn't hear that. Uh, but he said, the reason I brought this quote, he said, 
like Daniel and his friend, because we're going to Daniel right now. We prepare best for more strenuous future tests by passing the ones we are given in present. The first the test of eating, not eating, is a smaller test than eventually the, the test that may cost their life, right? So if we can pass this little test, we're prepared. We're, more, we're better prepared. So that's what he, he's saying. So, but when we remain faithful in face of rejection and persecution, Jesus promised a far greater, uh, a real far greater than power and status our presser now enjoys. So, okay, then the question we have, we're facing individually and collectively, this is for us to discuss, right? What are we facing today individually and uh, collectively that can be considered tribulation and how are we handling it? By the way, before I give you a few minutes to think about it, and going back to those 10 persecution in, in the first three century, not, it's not continuous. And when the good time come back, when the, when the persecution went away, during the persecution, a lot of people will, will deny Christ and, and fall away. And then the church later, when they want to come back, there's a great controversy in the church that we shouldn't let them back. You know, deny Christ once, you're out, never come back. And that becomes an issue. So probably doesn't impact us right now. But if somebody denied Christ, you know, uh, Peter did it three times. <laughs> and Jesus let him back. Yeah. But those churches will not let them back. They will not let them back. Okay, now, now let's think about this 